It has been a very difficult month since her accident. I'm trying to remember now. I can't recall a single moment of the funeral. Not a single one. I asked some of her friends how I reacted. They said that I had just stood there with my gray suit on, looking at the casket, astonished. It took several days until I realized that I lost her. The fact would not get into my mind. It was so out of my comprehension that my head simply hoped that it was not true. But with the most veritable and raw experience of my life. That day, she was driving her way to work on the same road in the same hour and probably listening to the same playlist when she passed away. She had a cup of tea that morning. She usually drinks coffee. She gave her a last kiss right after saying, see you later alligator, to me while I was reading the paper. A drunk driver crashed frontly in her car. The man died instantly, but the doctors told me that she struggled and bled for about eight minutes until her death. Some pieces of the engine crushed her legs and punctured her belly. They said that even if the emergency had arrived instantly, she would have died anyways. She did call 911 though. She also called me. They saw on her phone that she called me before 911. I was in a meeting, so I did not answer her. I cannot recall what were my last words to her. I don't know why the doctor explained it all to me. I don't know what they were thinking, showing me the pictures of the accident and explaining to me exactly how she died. I'd give anything to forget those pictures. I would often casually bite the skin on the top of her knee, just to see her laugh and try to get me off of her. I could see the same knee now, blood red and mashed mix of bone and meat. I love to put my hand on her belly before going to sleep. I used to feel the softness of her skin and I would sleep great knowing that the biggest treasure in my life was laying by my side. I saw her belly slashed by a metal chunk, blood and feces dropped by her hanging intestines. When I first fell in love with her, I could not get her face out of my head. When I was going to bed, the only thing that kept me awake was the memory of her sweet and fishy smile. I fell on her lap crying when she firstly said, I love you to me. I believed that it was the happiest day of my life. In those pictures, I saw her face was violently slammed against the car's panel. Her jaw broke and her eyes were full of blood. Her mouth was just hanging a piece of skin, dripping blood. I physically and mentally can't describe any more what was in those photos. I fell ill right after I saw those images. The mourning, the hopelessness, the pure sadness almost killed me. The only reason I did not commit suicide was because of her often talked to me about that. She would never be happy with my end in that way. Before I met her, I could not see any sense in life. I was almost giving up when she reminded me what life was worth living for. Every moment that I lived with her was special. Her kindness and her care had changed my perspective of life. She was a reason for my love of life at birth. When we talked about the death of the life since she would never talk about her death I would never die she said with that arcane and subtle smile the only she had in the whole world I never thought about her death although I always thought of mine my life was a complete with her she had single handedly changed my life she was always there for me and I was happy to be there for her she helped me grow Almost everything that gave me pleasure had some kind of involvement with her. I cannot do anything to look at anything now without remembering her. I even smell her skin and perfume when I am alone. I had to get rid of most of the furniture and decoration of the house. She would be mad with me, but everything had a, her little touch. The touch that made everything so fucking special. We built a cozy apartment over the last few years and now... It's just a cold couple of rooms with nothing more than grief and sorrow scattered all over the floor and walls. When we met, we thought that it won't be possible for us to be together. But destiny has some ways to find the right path. Life was brighter and cleaner with her. I felt safe and loved them when thinking about her. I always thought that love was bullshit. It all changed when I saw her smile and her glance. She had a unique pair of eyes, 
that were common to for them to delude myself in their looks. She had eyes of an oblique and disguised gypsy. Her voice was the safest sound I have ever heard in my life. No matter where we were, if I heard that sweet and calm voice of hers, it was home. I could not get any sleep without remembering the most amazing person in the world was reduced to a pile of meat and blood in a maze of automotive wreckage. Now I have no home. I leave my apartment much earlier in the morning than my work hours. I sit at my coffee shop booths and I just wait until work starts. I get all the extra hours of work available. I just cannot be in that apartment without her. I use the apartment just for sleep and to take care of a cat. She loved that cat. I didn't even like him very much in back in the day. He was not like other cats. He didn't purr. He didn't cuddle with anyone. He just minded his own business. He did not like anyone bossing him around, just like her. She loved that cat the minute she saw him in the animal shelter. He was severely malnourished and hurt. His previous owners hit and tortured him very often. They tied his neck in a very tight rope and refused to feed him properly. He was found on the street barely alive. The animal shelter people managed to take care of him, but he had lost an eye and partial vision of the other. She took him and took care of him like he was a child. In a few weeks, his fur before gray and shallow was now a deep sea of black and thick hairs. He was strong again, but he never recovered his ability to love humans again. They have hurt him and he was not given another chance at anyone. But I cannot get rid of him. As tough and as severe as he was, I learned to love that little cat. It was a solid reminder of her character of her ability to choose the other before herself. She was a pure human being, and every day I was thankful to the universe for putting her in my life. His fur reminded me of her black, thick hair. The smell of her hair when we were cuddled provoked the most comforting feeling in my life. If anyone could extract that scent, I would take baths in that thing, just to feel that again. After a few months, I decided to paint the apartment purple. She always wanted that, but every time she mentioned it, I said to her that no one with a good pair of eyes would like to see a purple wall. Now, I see the irony of that. As I loved her eyes very much, I managed to paint the house in one weekend. It was easy as the apartment had almost no furniture. At the finish, I laid on the couch and ordered some food. She didn't like to order food and we always prepared our meals, but I was too tired to cook. Her favorite meal was teriyaki chicken followed by a cup of coffee and a couple hours of sex. I fell asleep on the couch before the food arrived. I had to give a good tip to the doorman that paid for the pizza himself and hold it for me until the next morning. That morning, I woke up with the cat sleeping and purring on my lap. I've never seen him doing something like that. I thought that he was missing her too and smelled the scent on the couch. I felt strangely well that morning. I was even able to smile on the way back after work after seeing my neighbor trying to get his newspapers and accidentally dunking it on the water on the curb. It took me four months to be able to smile since her death. During the work, I came up with a list of things that she always said that she would like to do. Some crazy stuff, but the majority of it were doable. She was a little bit crazy, and that made me love her more. I was thinking of honoring her life and realizing myself her wishes. She would have wanted it. I was never an adventurer or a risk taker. She always pushed me to do crazy things to enjoy experiencing new stuff. And I think that her legacy on that would be nice to be reproduced. I would think to be the person that she would like to be when we were together. I sought to start with the simple stuff, like home remodeling, as I was already started with that because of the purple walls. When I came home after work that day, I started one of her wishes to paint a mural in our living room. She had drawn a beautiful illustration on Photoshop already. It was a gorgeous image about zodiac signs, every single one in a different color, some mystic symbols as well and as a lot of subtle lines. I never painted anything with her. 
I was afraid that we might move someday, and it was going to be a lot of trouble repainting that. I did not do many things with her because of my cowardice and selfishness, and I regret it every day of my life. I started a draft of the mural on the wall that day. I was never an artistic person, but I was impressed that I managed to do something that resembles some kind of beauty. I did not feel the time pass. It was already 2 a.m. and I needed to wake up at 6 a.m. I just laid on my bed and slept. In the middle of the night, I woke up with some water and to piss. And I felt something different when I stepped out of the bed. I unfolded the sheets and I saw that little bastard again. He sleeped up rolled and purring. Finally, the cat is starting to like people, I thought. I drank water, peed, went back to bed, and I grabbed that cat and put him right under my arm. I wanted to see what was the limit of his friendliness, and surprisingly, he just straightened up himself and started sleeping again. I felt very happy about that, and I slept cuddled with him. His dark fur reminded me so much of her thick hair. He even smelled like her. I fell asleep imagining her laying in bed with me. I woke up refreshed, just the way I used to wake before the accident. On my way to work, I went by a paint store to ask the vendors about what kind of paint to use on the wall and to get the colors right too. I spent much more than I was expecting, but it was worth it. She didn't care much about money anyways. She always wanted us to travel, but I was afraid of blowing our money traveling instead of investing it. I would burn all of my money right now just to hug her for one fucking minute again. Getting home, I started to prepare the paint for the mural, not caring about my dinner at all, but the cat cared about his dinner though. I was so focused on the mural that I forgot to feed him. He reminded me by walking between my legs with his tail upwards, rubbing himself against me. It was the first time that I saw him do that either. I quickly fed and returned to focus on the mural. I got the laptop open with the original image. The laptop was on the table in front of the wall. I was trying to get the colors right to start painting the first of the zodiac signs. I was up at 3 a.m. that night, but I managed to paint Aries and Sagittarius. I passed out sleeping, but the cat didn't come to sleep with me. When I woke up that morning, I realized that I forgot to turn off my laptop. I was going to turn it off, but I clearly remembered that it was open on Photoshop, and now it was open on the text archive. I glanced at it, and I didn't recognize it at all. I just assumed that the cat was walking over the keyboard, and he opened up the old text that she had written. But when I unpretentiously started to read that, I realized that I wasn't going to work that day and perhaps the rest of the week. The cat was standing on the side of the laptop that completely still. He looked at me in an almost identical way she looked at me. I could see the deepness in his eyes. I never noticed that. The content of the text was poorly written with many typos and the words were misspelled awkwardly like if someone tried to write that with their elbow. I read that fucking thing more times than necessary. The style of the writing, the unusual words, all of that definitely hurt right. In the letter, she apologized for leaving me too early. And she also declared her internal love with me again. She told me that as much as she wanted to write to me, time was the essence and the letter needed to be short as possible. Lose time writing about losing time and writing was a thing that she would do easily. She was very polite. It was very hard to read that with so many tears in my eyes. She told me that she went to hell and that she was there for most of what feels like a century. She told me that time passes differently in hell. She was suffering a lot and she doesn't think that she deserved that much. She said that life in hell is a nightmare. There is no peace, only fear and pain, she told me. I wouldn't want to know about what happens in hell. The only thing that she tried to say was, get me out of there. She also told me how she had written that the things that people call demonic possession is just a person that lives in hell communicating through a martyr.
a martyr is a being that passed through great suffering in their lives. And with that, they put in their souls next to the divine and the dead. Usually, the person that is possessed by demons is in great suffering, physically or mentally. The inhabitants of hell are usually very violent and brutal because they spend so much time in hell that they forget how to be civilized. She was relatively new to hell, only a few decades in their time. She told me that there was a thing to bring her back from the dead through a ritual. I would only need a few things, like a personal item of hers, some goat blood, a little bit of gold, and a few candles, and a place that she spent a lot of time. She suggested that I live in. But I would also need a reciprocal for the ritual, a body that her spirit would be able to take and she told me that it was impossible to get an adult spirit. The younger spirit was, the more likely the ritual would be succeeded. She told me to be strong and to hurry up. She was suffering a lot down there. And the time that I spent up here passed a lot slower in hell. She told me that a cat was a martyr, and then how she slowly took control of him and wrote that letter as a final move of strength. I was astonished after reading that. That shit was unbelievable. Very probably someone messing with me in a very sick way. I read that shit over and over again. I recognized her in the text, her style of writing, the words that she usually used with me, everything. I felt ill in bed after reading that. My stomach hurt a lot. I felt like puking and my head was killing me. My mind was shuffling itself. I could not think of anything solid. I felt lost in myself. After several hours of suffering in my brain, I began to think about the letter more clearly. I spent days reading that letter over and over again. I spent weeks researching that kind of ritual on the deep web, and unfortunately, all of the shit was making more and more sense to me. I was an atheist for my whole life, and I was doubting everything that was a real at that point. The idea of an afterlife scared me. The idea of my sweetheart being sent to hell revolted me. She believed in the supernatural, she told me, that she experienced a supernatural presence sometimes in her life. I doubt her in my mind, but at that moment, I knew that I was wrong my whole life. I was blaming myself for not doing the ritual and letting her stay trapped in hell. On the other side, I wasn't going to kill a child just in case I arranged every other object necessary for the ritual. I studied all the variables of it, and I memorized all the steps. I read every fucking thing available on the internet about this stuff. The only thing left to do was to bring a living child to our home. How come would she ask something like that of me? She would never tell me to harm another person. But she was in eternal suffering, and that was the only way out. The world would be a better place if she was here again, and I thought, fuck it. I am doing this. I knew the neighbor's daughter. She was a nine-year-old little girl with an adorable smile. I knew that she was alone at home every day until 2 p.m. to until 4 because her parents were working. It took me two weeks to finally build up the courage to knock on the neighbor's door and, and to take her. I was shaking and crying the whole time. I had to hit her in the head with a baseball bat to knock her out. It was the most horrible thing that I did in my life. I tied her up, put duct tape over her mouth, and put her in the right place of the ritual. Most of it went fine. I rehearsed this many times a day, I must say. It was not easy to do a ritual with that frightened look staring at me, but I knew it was going to be worth it. The final part of the ritual was the worst one. I had to suffocate her to death. It was very painful for me and took a lot of time to finally kill her. After I did that, I fell crying on the floor. Part of me was hopeful any moment that the point of the fallen body of the little girl would arise to be my beloved partner. I stood in the living room all night, but her body didn't move an inch. I read that in some cases, the spirit could get lost and it would take more time from them to take over the body, so I waited and waited. The neighbors had noticed her missing, of course, and the whole building helped them to look for her, including me. I was beyond suspicion. 
I was very truthful for them. But after some days, she began to smell. And I knew that if someone smelled something like that in my apartment, I was going to jail. It was very hard for me to realize that the ritual didn't work. I suffered more in those days than I suffered in my whole life. Not only the love of my life was dead, but now I was a murderer. I would not wish one third of what I'm suffering for the worst person in the world. I thought about taking my own life every day and every moment, but my love would never approve of that. She would kill me again in hell if I committed suicide. When the smell of the little girl's corpse began to grow strong and perfumes and deodorants were not working anymore, I finally managed to think of a way of disposing of her body. At that point, my spirit and mind were so broke that I started to do things more calmly and coldly. I was always fucked and my whole life I was a sad mess. I had nothing to lose. I went to a Walmart and I bought 10 big Tupperwares. I also went to a hardware store and bought a saw too. I don't want to describe what I did with her body in our bathtub, although I already described most of what evil things that I did. I could not even remember well of those moments of cutting her up. I put the Tupperwares in the trunk of my car, drove far from town, and buried them under an abandoned factory. I was already not crying, shaking, or nervous anymore. I just felt pointless. Those things that I did ruined my preservance of life. I was not an empty shell without a drop of hope. From that point on, I was just existing. I could not think of anything. I could not eat or sleep properly. I quit my job, and I began to spend more and more time researching suicide techniques. I couldn't support any more pain. This would be an act of mercy for me, myself. The day I died was a Wednesday. I received an email early in the morning from the person responsible for my death. The person wrote me about how he had hacked my Facebook account, how he gathered data of writing habits of her, how he had discovered all of my information reading my journal on Google Drive, and how he had drugged my cat, and how he manipulated me for his own pleasure. I did not read the whole email. I had made my mind in about 40% of it. It had several videos attached to it, videos that I assume were of me killing and hiding in the body of the little girl. He sure had some requirements and some shit like not to share the video, but I was not worried at all. Nobody and nothing was going to upset me anymore. Nothing would make me sadder. I reached the gun that I bought a couple days ago and shot myself in the head in a smooth and without hesitation move. Her blue and purple mural was with a big red piece of the brain and blood in it. At the moment, I did not care about where I was going. If there is an afterlife, great. If there is an afterlife, I would rather live in hell with her forever than live alone in that apartment one more second. Seconds later, I realized that there was no hell. I wish that there was a hell because now I'm trapped in the eternity of an infinite nothing.